Um, I was feeling nervous enough before coming up to speak here, and then after that introduction, I think I'll just go home if you don't mind. So, <laughs> Keith, th thanks, thanks for the for the setup. Um, so this is, um, I, I, I think there have been some really very impressive, all three presentations have been very, very impressive. Um, th this is quite a high-level abstract um, uh, presentation which looks at, at policy. So it looks really at, I suppose, the concepts of why government is getting engaged in this and, and particularly how government thinking around uh, the links between health and wealth have changed in, in, in Wales. Um, towards the end, there is some stuff about some of the policy choices that are being made, what to focus on, what directions <laughs> to take. Um, but there isn't a whole program of, you know, these are the grants we've got available, these are the offices, here are the telephone numbers, and the kinds of things that very often government would be presenting. So the focus is on, is on policy. Um, and what's driving it? Well, austerity, um, which has been covered already um, um, by Lars's presentation. These are very, very challenging times. All health budgets are under a severe pressure across, um, uh, across every spending department. Um, Wales, as I'm sure you know, gets a block grant from Westminster, and then we have limited discretion within that. So um, even more so than in England, um, it, it is a game of uh, priorities. So policy delivery in Wales, policy choices are about priorities. Um, and health is right at the heart of that. Um, and since it's the new year, I thought I'd say, you know, we need to shift the curves. All of us are thinking about this in the new year. Um, and these two curves show um, the red curve um, is, is um, forecast cost of health services. Um, and, and that's driven by a number of things. It's, it's driven by uh, demographic change. It's driven by advances in technology, which give us more available thera therapies, but they come at a cost, obviously. It's driven by increases in, um, it, it, uh, increases in payroll costs within the NHS uh, and a whole host of other things. And the dotted blue line is forecast increases in national income. Um, as you can see, there's a big gap there. And these forecasts are very similar for most developed economies. Um, one, of the, one of the examples often quoted is that in the United States, on current trends, um, the entire federal budget will be taken up by healthcare costs by around 2030 or something like that. Clearly, that's not sustainable, and governments everywhere have to think about ways that they can bring down that demand curve, bring down the need curve, um, and, uh, and, and, and close that gap, because nobody's really got a clue about how we're going to be able to, to bridge it. Um, in Wales... Um, we have a new health minister who's been in post for about, um, about a year, I think, just coming up to a year. Uh, la last week, uh, he made a fairly big speech um, around prudent health care and prudent medicine. Um, and what he was proposing was that um, we need, in some cases, to do less. Um, and one of the most quoted headlines from what he said was that up to 20% of interventions either do harm or there's no evidence of benefit. Across a whole range of different interventions, tonsillectomies, prescription of antibiotics, um, but also some of the specific interventions. Um, and so in Wales, he wants to promote, and Mansell Aylward is very closely um, involved with him in this, um, the, um, the, the, the concept of um, minimal appropriate intervention um, backed by evidence of effectiveness. Um, and, and looking at things like, as well as nice technology appraisals for recommended interventions, as well, nice technology uh, recommendations for non-recommended interventions, where, you know, in many cases, we're still doing these things because that's just, you know, the habit that everybody is in. Um, and he's also looking for a change in behaviours from patients and the public to a large extent, and he wants to <coughs> shift the debate. Um, and um, he, he's, he's um, you know, as a minister, he's giving some fairly strong messages for a minister uh, about wanting to move the debate away from people turning up to the doctor and saying, basically, you know, what can you do for me? Um, to a discussion about you know, what can we do together or how can you help me to manage this issue that I have, which might be a chronic issue, might be an acute issue or something else. And trying to pull back from the health service, instinctively just wrapping his arms around everybody and taking all of their cares and concerns away and saying that you know, this is about, sorry to use the word, co-production and that you know, people need to take some responsibility and accountability for their own care and the health system needs to intervene but to the minimum level possible. Now, this is about health and wealth policy. So where are we on wealth policy? The Welsh Government's priorities. It's quite instructive, actually, to do a... Um, I know this is recorded, so I've got to be quite careful what I'm saying. But it's quite instructive to do a Google search on Welsh Government top priorities. And the first two pages will give you just about everything, um, which has been described at, one, at some point in the last two or three years as top priority. Needs, um, education, skills, um, environment, climate change, whatever it is. Um, but the ones that consistently come out at the top are jobs, growth, wealth, skills, and ending poverty or tackling poverty. 
Now, these are all very much economic objectives. It's all about the economy, stupid, in terms of the Welsh Government's overall priorities because there's a belief that this improves all things. A rising economic tide lifts all the boats and will deal with many of the health problems that we've got as, um, as we saw in Kevin's presentation around public health issues. But if you look at where government spends its money, um, the allocation, it does not necessarily match those top-line priorities. Now, admittedly, I'm focusing here on specific economic development budgets. That is, the sectors and business budget and the science and innovation budget. Obviously, education contributes to the economy, transport infrastructure contributes to the economy, housing and community regeneration contributes to the economy, but that's how much Wales spends specifically on <coughs> business development and economic development. And if you compare that to health and social care, you know, there's a vast, vast difference. More than half of the budget in Wales goes on health and social care. We spend more on NHS, NHS Wales staff training and development than we spend on economic development in Wales. So the question, therefore, is, if jobs, growth, and wealth are our number one priority, what is health and social care doing to contribute to achieving those aims? How can we flex health and social care spending and activity to help contribute to economic growth in Wales, to creating jobs and growth, which will then give a payback back into the health system? Um, and, and so, you know, a nice little diagram there. Um, how do we link health uh, and well-being and equality, wealth, innovation, and value? How do all of these things come together? And what kind of policy changes can we do that will deliver all of these together? And the HSN is very much in, in squarely doing that kind of thing. There's a slide on HSNs in a minute. Um, one thing we certainly can't do is just carry on doing what we've been doing um, and hope that somehow we get a different result. Um, so um, this, is, this is one quote. I think there's another quote about you know, the... Sometimes something like doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result is just uh, is a definition of idiocy or something. I'm, I'm not entirely sure what that quote is. Um, but we can't you know, use the same thing. We've got to think in a different way, and that effectively is about innovation. That means innovation. We've got to innovate. We've got to change something that we do. Um, one of the things that we're, we are changing is trying to get a clearer focus on, on how these interactions work. It's all very well to say health and wealth are linked, but you know, how? What are the mechanisms? And therefore, how can we bring focus on them? Um, so first, this is the focus on the individual, health and wealth, at the level of the individual. Poverty, housing, environments, links between poverty and health outcomes, economic activity at the level of the individual, whether you're capable of being in employment because of illness or otherwise. And all of these things are areas where these interlap. The chief medical officer is leading mostly on this. She would describe it sometimes as shifting the demand curve by promoting uh, well-being. Um, but it's also sometimes described as health in all policies. How do we, and Australia has done quite a lot of leading work on this, how do we flex our other policies to help improve health and population well-being? This is the kind of stuff that Public Health Wales does. Inverse care law is very relevant to some of the deprivation that we have in the valleys um, and, and other things. My main focus today is, 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 is on this, which is the focus on um, how health and wealth are linked through the medium of the enterprise, so that business organisations, enterprise, is the nexus for these things. And how can we better flex the major assets and resources that we have in the NHS to create more value, to apply research, to close that feedback loop of evidence into practice, and within the healthcare system, provide freedom to innovate, um, make it easier and more encouraging to work with industry. And that then feeds back into attracting inward investment into Wales, creating an ecosystem, better access for industry to work with people. This thing I put up because it looks nice, um, but also, for those of you who have been following the news over the Christmas period, there's a lot of talk about tricorders. Can you see that? 2014 is the year of the tricorder. So this device is the Scanadu Scout. It's tiny. It's about the size of, well, it's about the size of this, I suppose. Um, and it's obviously a very aptly designed looking nice thing. And what you do is you stick it to the side of your head, and it will give you readings on all of these things. Heart rate, skin and core body temperature, oximetry, respiratory rate, blood pressure, ECG, emotional stress. I'm not sure how it does that. Um, but uh, maybe it reads your mind or something. Um, this is linked to your iPhone in an app. This feeds data up to your clinician, to uh, some sort of cloud-based stuff. You know, whether or not this is all hype, this particular one or not, someone is going to invent something like this. And it's going to change healthcare because people are going to be monitoring their own health. They're going to be feeding up constant information. We're not going to get people turning up because they're already ill. This is the kind of... Uh, but, but to get this into, in, into use to sell, you need to work with healthcare systems, get it into the field, get evidence on whether it works, change behaviours, etc. You know, where can you do that? It's difficult to get into systems. Um, we, we can't hang about. HSNs are already doing this. Northern Ireland is doing major stuff on jobs, growth, health. 
Scotland has got a statement of intent on innovation, health, and wealth that they published a couple of years ago. So, you know, we've got to get cracking and we've got to catch up. And that doesn't mean copying exactly what everybody else is doing. All the HSM is different, as you say, but it does mean learning. Um, and ideally, learning from other people's mistakes so that we don't do them. <laughs> um, we need to be clear about what we cannot, cannot do. This is a massive global market, not just for products, but for inward investment, for attracting business partnerships and collaborations, for attracting research. Very, very competitive indeed. And Wales is a small place. Um, we can't spend our way to success. Um, you know, we think that our healthcare market is big. Uh, we spend close to a billion pounds a year on products and services, uh, close to a billion pounds a year on pharma. But in the global context, even in the UK context, that's not really, you know, that's not really relevant. That's not the route for us to distinguish ourselves. And our research community is excellent in some, in some places, lots of excellent people in this room. But we're never going to be able to bring the same intellectual firepower as the Boston cluster or the Oxford and Cambridge cluster. And we better be honest about that up front. So what can we do? Um, and, and you know, when we are clever, people will try to outspend us or steal our academics or steal our <coughs> ideas and inventions. Um, so we need to find out in a way which people can't really replicate very easily. Um, and what kind of things can we do that other people can't, or other systems can't? <coughs> whole population data approaches. Now, we have a whole national population cohort, potentially, with already very, very good data around it. So e-health, everybody agrees e-health is going to be huge, but how many other places can quite quickly get to a whole population system? A complete healthcare system. We have one purchase ledger for our entire NHS. Every item goes through one ledger. Who else can do that? We have a stable system, not tumultuous reform all the time. Fairly simple, only seven health boards. And we can leverage that to focus on access, focus on agility and speed. And being faster is something that others um, can't just quickly buy their way into. You've got to work hard at, at speed. So this is the direction that our health and wealth policy is going. Um, where are we at the minute? This is the last slide. Don't worry, Keith. I can see you getting up. Good, you haven't got a water pistol. Um, university health boards designated. There is um, ongoing uh, a discussion about what is a university health board? What's the difference between a local health board and a an university health board. What does that signify? And how will health boards be more than what they were, particularly in research, teaching, and application of knowledge into practice, doing that more effectively and more efficiently? NISCA is coming to the end of its restructuring, which is looking at the way that it funds research, the mechanisms and structures and institutions that it has. That's coming up fairly soon towards completion. Um, a, an external innovation advisory board has offered the health minister a whole set of recommendations on health and wealth in Wales, which is very much aligned with the, with the previous slide and this presentation. That's been jointly endorsed by the health and the economy ministers, and we're currently working on an implementation plan over the next couple of months, I would say, probably. There's a life sciences hub opening in this, th this summer, which will be a designated access point. Again, a major investment by the Welsh Government, £2 million a year, roughly, um, uh, running costs to front up the whole of our health ecosystem and wealth ecosystem in Wales and make it far easier to access the right people quickly. And there are ongoing reviews of the way that we manage IP, commercialization, knowledge transfer, technology transfer um, throughout the health and social care system. So there's a lot going on at the moment. And no doubt there'll be questions so I can ask some, answer some of the specifics, but hopefully that was helpful. <laughs>